the distinction between leukemia and lymphoma. Now, leukemia is a lymphoid neoplasm, but it tends to originate in the bone marrow, and usually you're going to find the tumor cells in the peripheral bloodstream. And that's different than lymphoma, which is also a lymphoid neoplasm, but tends to arise as a discrete tumor mass in a lymph node. So I think it helps, even though these have a very sort of similar course, the leukemias are more of a liquid tumor, so they're usually found in the bloodstream, Lymphomas eventually will become a liquid tumor, but more early on in the course, they tend to be a discrete tumor mass originating again, usually in a lymph node. Now, one other important distinction to make here, sometimes uh, leukemia gets confused with what's called a leukemoid reaction. You know, a leukemoid reaction is simply defined as an increase in the white blood cell count, so a leukocytosis combined with a left shift. And a left shift just means that you get a lot more band forms in the peripheral blood smear than normal. And band forms are those immature white blood cells that have a lot of different lobes to their nucleus. And it's perfectly normal during a bad infection to see a leukemoid reaction, which is, again, is a leukocytosis with a left shift or an increase in the bands. And the bands can be as high as 80% sometimes. Now that is not leukemia, okay? It's a normal response to a bad infection. Now the way you can sometimes tell the difference between a leukemoid reaction and a malignant neoplasm is to check something called the leukocyte alkaline phosphatase. And in the case of a leukemoid reaction, the leukocyte alkaline phosphatase is going to be quite high. And in the case of something like a myeloproliferative disorder, like chronic myelogenous leukemia, or CML, for example, you're going to see a pretty low value of the leukocyte alkaline phosphatase. So with those distinctions out of the way, let's talk about lymphoma. Now, we tend to divide lymphoma into two categories, Hodgkin's lymphoma and non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Now, some key differences between the two are the following. So for Hodgkin's lymphoma, there's a special type of cell that you'll see on the biopsy called a Reed-Sternberg cell. The Reed-Sternberg cell must be present in order for a diagnosis of Hodgkin's lymphoma to be made. It's necessary for the diagnosis. However, it's not sufficient for the diagnosis, and that's an important point. So the Reed-Sternberg cell is necessary but not sufficient for the diagnosis of Hodgkin's lymphoma. Reed-Sternberg cells are not present in non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Now, one other big difference between the two is that in Hodgkin's lymphoma, we tend to have a localized single group of lymph nodes, okay? So the patient may present with a bunch of lymph nodes swollen on one side of their neck. It's a very common presentation for a Hodgkin's lymphoma. Non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, when it presents, tends to already be pretty widespread, and you're going to have multiple areas of lymph nodes involved in different parts of the body. So they may have inguinal lymph nodes, cervical lymph nodes, and abdominal lymph nodes, all affected at the same time. So that's more common for a non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. The other important distinction is that there are a lot of constitutional symptoms associated with Hodgkin's lymphoma. Constitutional symptoms mean systemic symptoms, weight loss, fever, fatigue, night sweats. Those kind of things are associated with Hodgkin's much more than they're associated with non-Hodgkin's, although they can be present in both. Now, both types of lymphoma can sometimes be associated with Epstein-Barr virus infection. In a few minutes, we'll talk about which ones are influenced by Epstein-Barr virus and which ones are not. And lastly, one way to tell the prognosis in terms of a Hodgkin's lymphoma is going to be with how many Reed-Sternberg cells are present versus how many lymphocytes are present. Now, that does not hold true in a non-Hodgkin's lymphoma because, as we said, there are no Reed-Sternberg cells in a non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. So we'll talk about how this prognosis changes in just a few minutes. So just a quick word on the Reed-Sternberg cell. There's a picture on your screen now of what this looks like. It's essentially a binucleate or a bilobate cell. You can see clearly that there are two lobes. And it's sort of sometimes referred to as appearing as owl's eyes. It looks like the two big eyes of an owl. Again, this is necessary but not sufficient for a diagnosis of Hodgkin's disease. These cells, importantly, on flow cytometry are going to be CD30 positive as well as CD15 positive, and you should memorize that for step one, both CD30 positive and CD15 positive. I think it's easy to remember because 15 is just half of 30, so that's an easy way to keep those two numbers in your head. Now, one other important point that's sometimes tested on step one is that reed sternberg cells are interesting because they actually are undergoing somatic hypermutation. If you think back to our talk on immunology, you'll remember that somatic hypermutation is one mechanism that lymphocytes use in order to increase the variability of the antibodies that they can produce. So all that means is that when lymphocytes are reproducing, they get pretty sloppy with their DNA polymerases, and they make a lot of errors. 
and there's a lot of errors of replication. And that's actually a good thing because it creates more genetic variability and the ability to create different kinds of antibodies. Now, interestingly, these reed Sternberg cells are actually just dysfunctional lymphocytes. Because of that, they have a lot of somatic hypermutation. Again, a point you should keep in mind on step one. Now, to talk more about Hodgkin's lymphoma in general, we have to divide it into four basic types. The first is called nodular sclerosing Hodgkin's lymphoma. Nodular sclerosing is the most common variant of Hodgkin's lymphoma, and it's usually found in young women. So if you have a young woman with Hodgkin's lymphoma, on step one, you want to think about the nodular sclerosing subtype. Now, this tends to have an excellent prognosis, and the reason is that there are a lot of lymphocytes and very few reed sternberg cells. And again, more reed sternberg cells means worse prognosis, and less reed sternberg cells means better prognosis. So in this case, lots of lymphocytes, few reed sternberg cells, good prognosis. On histology, you can differentiate the nodular sclerosing subtype based on the fact that you will see a lot of collagen banding. And the next type is called mixed cellularity. And as the name implies, there are a whole lot of reed sternberg cells, but there are also a whole lot of lymphocytes. And so as a result, this subtype tends to have an intermediate prognosis because there's a pretty much an equal amount of both lymphocytes and reed sternberg cells. Now, mixed cellularity type is actually associated with Epstein-Barr virus infection. So that's the first of the lymphomas we're going to talk about that is associated with Epstein-Barr virus infection. Now, again, on biopsy for these patients, you're going to see a whole lot of lymphocytes and a whole lot of reed sternberg cells. The next subtype of Hodgkin's lymphoma is called lymphocyte predominant. Easy to remember, the name implies there are a lot of lymphocytes, very few reed sternberg cells. As a result, excellent prognosis for these patients. This tends to be young males, so usually males less than 35, Females less than 35, if you remember, was supposed to be mostly nodular sclerosing. Last type is going to be lymphocyte depleted. This is a rare subtype, but very dangerous because lymphocyte depleted implies very few lymphocytes and a lot more reed Sternberg cells. Again, very poor prognosis in that situation. This subtype is the second type of lymphoma we're talking about that is associated with Epstein-Barr virus. So, so far we have mixed cellularity, Hodgkin's lymphoma, and we have lymphocyte depleted, Hodgkin's lymphoma, as the two subtypes that are associated with the Epstein-Barr virus. Now, one other important point for step one regarding Hodgkin's lymphoma is the staging system. Now, in general, on step one, you don't need to know much about cancer staging, but for Hodgkin's lymphoma, it's very simple and is sometimes tested. All that you have to remember is that stage one means it's in a single lymph node, Stage two means it's in more than one lymph node, but they're on the same side of the diaphragm. Stage three means they're on both sides of the diaphragm. Stage four means it's outside of the lymph node system. So you'll have it in a different organ, for example. That makes it automatically stage four. So that's a good overview of Hodgkin's lymphoma. Now let's talk about non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Now before we get started going over each type of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, it's important for you to realize that the genetics of these lymphomas is often tested on step one, and it is important that you memorize the translocations between the chromosomes that are responsible for each of these different types of lymphoma. So with that being said, let's start with Burkitt's lymphoma. Now this is a B-cell lymphoma that really has two varieties. The first is a sporadic form, which is found all over the world, and usually these tumors arise either in the pelvis or in the abdomen. Now there's also an endemic form that is found usually in Africa and usually in children. And this endemic form tends to present with a tumor in the jaw. So these, these patients will present with a very large jaw tumor. And you see that when you think about Burkitt's lymphoma. Now, both varieties are associated with the Epstein-Barr virus. That's important. And the genetic mutation here is actually a translocation between chromosomes eight and 14. So this 814 translocation causes a gene called CMYK to get moved very, very close to the gene for the immunoglobulin heavy chain. So when you put the CMYK gene next to the immunoglobulin heavy chain gene, what you actually end up with is a constituently active version of CMYK. And that is a bad thing because CMYK is an oncogene, meaning that normally its job is to suppress the cell cycle. But when it gets mutated and turned on, it actually will cause the cell cycle to move forward. If it's always on, you're going to get uncontrolled cell proliferation in a malignant tumor. On histology, Burkitt's lymphoma is recognized because it has a starry sky appearance. The reason you see a starry sky appearance is because there are these huge sheets of lymphocytes all very crowded together with interspersed macrophages in between them. And macrophages are large, very clear cytoplasm, 
So what this ends up resembling is a starry sky pattern, very classic for a Burkitt's lymphoma. The next type of lymphoma we're going to discuss is the diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. Now, the diffuse large B-cell lymphoma is the most common adult non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. As the name implies, it's diffuse, meaning it spreads very quickly. This is a very aggressive tumor. That's a bad thing because it can spread so quickly, but a good thing because it actually makes it more responsive to chemotherapy. And that's the important point you should remember about a diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. Now, the next type is going to be mantle cell lymphoma, which actually has a very poor prognosis and is very non-responsive to chemotherapy. The translocation here is between chromosomes 11 and 14. And you should also know that there is, on flow cytometry, an association with CD5. So these tumors tend to be CD5 positive. And if you remember back to our previous talk on Hodgkin's lymphoma, we said Hodgkin's lymphoma tends to be CD15 positive and CD30 positive, but this one, mantle cell, is actually CD5 positive. And the last type of B-cell lymphoma we're going to discuss is a follicular lymphoma. Now, this is another sort of difficult to cure with chemotherapy sort of lymphoma. And the reason for it is because this lymphoma tends to progress very slowly, it divides very slowly, and has more of an indolent course. And as you might learn in other oncology courses you've had, slower growing tumors that are not replicating as quickly tend to be less responsive to chemotherapy. And this is one good example of that. Now, the translocation in this case is very important to remember. It's between chromosomes 14 and 18. And what's interesting is that when you get that translocation, you get overexpression of a gene called BCL2. And the job of BCL2 in a normal person is to inhibit apoptosis. Now, if you have overexpression of that gene, you're going to have too much inhibition of apoptosis, and the cells are not going to die when they're supposed to. You'll get uncontrolled proliferation and a tumor. Very important to remember that translocation. Now, there are also neoplasms of the mature T cell, and there are really two types you need to know for step one. The first is going to be the adult T cell lymphoma, and this is actually caused by HTLV1, which is a virus. And the HTLV1 virus is a retrovirus similar to HIV, and like HIV, it's actually also sexually transmitted. It tends to be very prevalent in Japan and West Africa and in the Caribbean. It's very rare in the United States. But when these patients present, they usually present with a skin tumor, so a cutaneous lesion. Now, it's important, even though these patients do present with a skin lesion, that you not confuse this with the next type of cancer, which is a cutaneous T-cell lymphoma. So that's different than the adult T-cell lymphoma. Now, the second type, cutaneous T-cell lymphoma, is also known as mycosis fungoides, okay, because it's such a predominant skin involvement with such widespread and large, these sort of diffuse nodular skin lesions that it actually resembles a fungal infection of the skin. And so we call it mycosis fungoides, even though it has nothing to do with fungus, it's simply a cutaneous T-cell lymphoma. Now, interestingly, when this cutaneous T-cell lymphoma leaves the skin and actually spreads into the bloodstream, we then give it a new name and we call it Cesare syndrome. And we call the cells Cesare cells once they spread into the bloodstream. So those are the two types of T-cell lymphomas. 